Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, I catch up with Jordi Bailina and David Schwartz from Hermes to talk about ZKEVM. They share an update about Hermes since their launch on Mainnet earlier this year. We talk about the L2 landscape, ZK rollups, and how different teams are approaching EVM compatibility on their respective chains. We then dig into ZK EVM, a model where they are using zero knowledge proofs throughout the architecture to give it the characteristics of a rollup that is cheap and fast, while still allowing for this EVM to run and compile in the same way as the Ethereum EVM. And this episode was also recorded just days before the team made a massive announcement about the Polygon Hermes merger. So do stick around to the end of the episode. We recorded a little bonus bit about this and what this would mean for the zero knowledge ecosystem. Quick note before we start, if you haven't already seen it, the Zero Knowledge podcast website was recently updated. There's all sorts of new ways to engage. You can check out the blog. You can actually post on the community forum, get in touch with us, sign up for newsletters, check out the YouTube videos. They're all there. And uh, I'm really excited that it's kind of come together in one place. Um, Do check out the new jobs board as well. You can actually post your jobs there yourself now as a hiring team. And if you're someone looking for a job, there's much better ways to kind of sort and filter now. So yeah, hope to see you over there. One more point before we start in on this episode, I want to thank this week's sponsor, Mina Protocol. Mina is the world's lightest blockchain, powered by participants. It's a layer one protocol working to connect crypto to the real world. This means developers can leverage private, verified, real-world data from any website to build decentralized apps. Mina's decentralized apps, which are called Snaps, also allow users to access on-chain services without sacrificing personal data privacy. And Mina is a unique blockchain. It's replaced the traditional blockchain with a zero-knowledge proof, ensuring a super light chain that stays around 22 kilobytes and allows every participant to act as a full node. Mina's mainnet has been live for a few months, and the ecosystem is growing fast. So join the community and find out more by visiting minaprotocol.com. Quick side note, I am both an advisor to the project and a validator with the ZK Validator, so that's also another reason why you should go check it out. So thank you again, Mina, for sponsoring the show. Now here's my interview about ZK EVM with Jordi and David. Today, I'm here with Jordi Bailina and David Schwartz from Hermes and IDEN3. Hi, guys. Hi. Hello, Nana. Jordi, you were on the show pretty recently, actually. You came on to talk to us about Hermes. But today's episode, what we want to do is actually dig into ZK EVM, something that a lot of us learned about only at ECC about a month ago. So yeah, I'm really excited to, to learn more about this. David, this is the first time we're meeting Maybe you could quickly introduce yourself and tell us what you're working on at Hermes. Sure. Thanks. Uh, well, my role at um, Hermes is the project, project lead. I'm trying to push the project forward and to coordinate the activities and also working very hard on the product side of the technology we are developing. So, yeah, this is an amazing moment, especially for Hermes. And probably we can discuss a little more today. Yeah. But yeah, amazing time. Yeah. I mean, we did do an entire episode on Hermes, and so I will link to that in the show notes. Hermes, an L2, that is, as far as I understand, it's it's live, right? It's been live for some time. Absolutely. It's, uh, production, it's in production. Right now, it's uh, forging a block every 10 minutes, and there are Amazing. many transactions, and it's, it's just a uh, it's service that anybody can use it there. Maybe before we dig into the ZK EVM, the kind of topic of this show, I do want to hear like what's new. We, I think our interview is like back in January. So this was before the launch. I'd love to hear, you know, what, what's happened since then and maybe what's potentially coming up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much you can divulge, but. Uh... <laughs> yes, well, David, maybe you can answer it. Yeah, from the last interview, I was not there, but uh, I, I guess you were discussing about the, the launch of the Hermes network. At this point, uh, we were uh, launching the first release of the, the Hermes, where we were focused basically on payments. And um, yeah, we, we became live. We are mainnet. We started the, the initial steps 
towards network stability. And we, we started then to do some promotions of the network to launch some activities in order to test that the system was stable, was secure. And uh, from here, we have been building the, the next steps or working in the behind the scenes to, to launch the next uh, features. We also shared the public roadmap a couple of months ago where we just um, announced the whole uh, activities and, and features for the whole next year. And yes, uh, this is basically what we have been doing. Uh, we went to Paris at CC. Mm -hmm. We Jordi introduced the CKBM at this point um, because we want to share with the community the work we are doing in order to just to get contributors or just provide new ideas and also get new ideas from the community. And at this point, we are very focused on this project of the CKBM. On the other hand, we continue developing the, the product features for the first version based on uh, crypto payments. So this is the current situation. Maybe we should define, even though we do have an entire episode on Hermes, maybe you can tell us a little bit about like what makes Hermes unique in the L2 landscape. Well, Hermes is uh, decentralized. And the protocol of Hermes is designed to be decentralized. That means that the coordinator of a roll-up, uh, anybody can be a coordinator. It's true that right now it's not worthy to be a coordinator because there are not so many transactions there. And being a coordinator is a little bit expensive. But once we reach this break-even, which is, in the case of Hermes, is the lowest break-even. So right now the Hermes is the, the roll-up that has most cheap transactions in, in cost terms. So we are very close to get this break-even. Then uh, new coordinators will become, we will start to uh, bidding for slots and start are forging batches and, and and this will give the decentralization. All the protocol is designed to be fully decentralized and this is uh, quite unique. I would say that this is our, that mainly the, the two big uh, differences. Eh? A, a protocol that's fully de is, is decentralized by design, it's governance less. So the, the idea is that uh, at some point there is no governance, it's just a product that's working there. And the cost of the verification, uh, the cost proof, uh, the cost of batching batch is, is the lowest in the, in the space right now. Would you say, I mean, like privacy, it doesn't sound like it's one of your current, like unique propositions, but is that something that you do see as part of the roadmap? It is, but right now we are more focused in the ZKVM. Uh, so ZKVM, uh, ZKVM in some way it includes privacy because you can, you know, in ZKVM you can do yeah. whatever you do. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, here we are more focused in the ZKVM that let's say that with private private payments in some way. Got it. So when we talk about this EVM and like EVM compatibility, ZK EVM, in the current L2 landscape, are there any L2s that are already like EVM compatible, would you say? There are projects that's working in EVM compatible. And here we are, again, we are talking about like two big groups. One is the optimistic groups. For them, I would say that the EVM part is easy. Okay, they have the problem of this of this challenge game that they have behind, but including the EVM is a challenge, but it's not, a, it's not a, such a big challenge as is for the ZK EVM. And in this, I know that, for example, Optimistic is working on, on this way, and there are other Optimistic uh, projects that are working in that direction. In the ZK side, there are different projects that some way or the other is uh, working on that. ZK Sigma Labs, for sure. Uh, Star Wars is working mm -hmm. also in, in that direction. I know that Lubring is also starting to do something in that direction, or at least thinking on that. Uh, of course, Aftec people, they are also doing a great job in that direction. Uh, even the Ethereum Foundation is, is working maybe more in the research side, but it's also working in that direction. Because it's important, at the end, we are talking about scaling smart contracts. So this is an important piece. And there are many groups and many people that uh, some way or the other, maybe with different approaches or with different things, but they are working in this path. Got it. Where do you want to start to explain what ZK EVM really means? 
Right now, um, in the current Hermes, that's uh, in production. Right now, you can do payments. You can do you can do transfers. Okay, you can. It's like a little bit like Bitcoin. You can tra- do just transfers in there. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, with ZKBM, you have uh, actually you can run the smart contracts. The idea is is ha- it's having a roll up, exactly the same that roll up, but instead of doing a payment, you can deploy a smart contract and execute a transaction in a smart contract. And this is a, a big difference. A roll up that's executing smart contracts. That's mainly what it is. And in the case of ZKVM, just to be clear, it's ZKVM is uh, zero knowledge uh, Ethereum virtual virtual machine. Okay, so the Ethereum virtual machine, the EVM, it's actually the uh, virtual machine that's running in Ethereum. Smart contracts are you know are executed in this uh, VM. And ZKVM is just having a roll-up that's executing exactly the same smart contracts that are currently running in Ethereum. That's what means ZKVM. I, I watched actually that presentation that you gave at ECC, and in it you talked a lot about opcodes. Mm-hmm. Opcodes that would normally be in, I guess, running on the EVM. I don't know if that's how you say it. But what what do you mean when you use that term opcodes? What are, what do those look like? Or maybe what are some examples? Yeah, opcode is um, instructions. So when you do a smart contract in Solidity, this is compiled. Okay, this is compiled to a, a machine language. Okay, this machine mm-hmm. language is assembly. If you want this, this machine language is composed of executing different opcodes that is executing, and these are the the instructions that uh, the final instructions that actually is running the VM. These instructions include, for example, doing uh, an addition, pushing a value to the stack, uh, uh, setting a value to memory, recovering a value from the storage. These are these very, very uh, small instructions that the virtual machine is processing every time you do execute a smart contract. So the idea of is the, the compatibility when we are talking about uh, of code compatible means that we are able to get this compiled uh, program with all these uh, instructions with all these opcodes and you just can take it and run it in the ZKVM without transpiling or without doing anything. It's just fully compatibility in this side. On the developer side, I'm guessing like they could use the same tooling, but on that compiling part, like, is it actually compiling into something different or is it actually following the same, the same thing that you'd see on an EVM? This is the difference, the difference of, on the approaches. When you are doing opcode compatible, actually you can use exactly the same compiler and you get the, the result and you just, instead of, uh, it's like having a side chain, but in the case it's a roll up, but you just take this transaction, you just run it and you don't need to do anything else. Just uh, mm-hmm. get this, this, this code, this smart contract you deploy, you use the same tooling, and all that stuff. There are other approaches. They are actually they change the compiler. So instead of compiling to this EVM to this EVM opcodes, we are compiling to another set that are more maybe it's more ZK optimal opcodes, and you're just executing this different virtual machine that's not opcode compatible. Mm-hmm. But maybe the, the Solidity uh, program you can compile it into different in, like in, in, in two machines into different machines. These are the two approaches. Got it. So what you're saying is like from the developer side, they would still be potentially just writing a Solidity contract, deploying it. But what's happening under the hood with ZK EVM, it's actually following the same path that it would on the original EVM. Yes, or at least very, 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 very similar. Okay, it's not. You don't need a different compiler. You don't need a different tool set. You don't. You don't need to care about special things. Just, just do the same. Just having like a side chain. Just a side chain is a rollout. We, we are bringing the opcode concept to the table because when you go into the details on what uh, a seed KVM implementation means, you need to go into this level of, uh, of details, you know, to go down and say, look, implementation of this uh, EVM means that we need to be compatible for the same set of operational codes that this virtual machine supports. So the challenge is to analyze every single opcode that Ethereum virtual machine supports and figure out how to implement that. Jody was saying the same. I mean, we have two options. Either we can just uh, build a new virtual machine with mm-hmm. a different set of codes and, and compile Solidity programs, programs into this virtual machine, or we can figure out how to build from bottom to top code and a system that is the same set of codes and that the Ethereum virtual machine. So you can be able to port existing Solidity or existing smart contracts code directly to this new system. So this is the why we are 
<clears throat> bringing this of code to the set uh, and discussion to the table. Would that mean like you kind of talked about each opcode, but are you forced to go in to each particular opcode and like re-implement it? Or is it more like a general re-implementation that's happening? No, no, it's uh, it's very detailed. You have to go each one and okay. try to keep uh, the compatibility uh, as much as you can there. It's, it's not a general thing. It's um, opcode by opcode and structure by structure. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going trying to be as close as possible to the current Ethereum machine. How many opcodes are there, actually? Well, I need to check it, but roughly, uh, roughly it's about maybe, <laughs> uh, I don't know, 50. Um, 50, I need to check. Okay, so it's, it, oh, I, I was thinking you were going to say something like thousands. No, no. But okay, it's like 50, 50 under yeah, 100. Most, and lots of them, okay. like, most of the, a lot of them are like um, repeating ones, you know. It's, for example, if I push one byte, push two bytes, push three bytes, push four bytes, this is, okay, these are okay, 32 okay. opcodes, but actually it's the same. So, but it's like around... 50, maybe 70 altogether, but so just this, this few tens uh, of opcodes. I want to hear a little bit about the ZK part of this. So what you've described is sort of like the rebuilding of an, of an EVM from the opcodes individually, kind of rebuilding them. But like, where does the zero knowledge come in? Because when you're saying you're rebuilding it, it sounds like that's maybe what you have to incorporate somewhere. Well, at the end, it's like rollups. You have a set of transactions that execute smart contracts, like Ethereum transactions, but there's just those transactions, and you are aggregating and you are processing all of them transactions, and at the end, computing a proof that all these transactions are well computed. And, and this is where the zero knowledge comes. The thing is that you verifying uh, that a payment is valid is quite easy, verifying that a transaction that needs to be executed with all these opcodes and memory and all that stuff is valid is much, much, much harder. Okay, and, and but at the end, the, the idea is exactly the same that the standard rollup. You need to verify that a set of transactions, so you go from state A to state D when you execute these uh, 100 transactions. So you need the proof that state B is correct without having to compute everything. And you verify that. And this is a, so the idea is exactly the same that a normal roll up. Here, probably the zero, so that the, the word zero knowledge is like not the right one. It's more the verification of a computation. Actually, zero knowledge is, um, it goes very close because this, because this succinct verification is, uh, it's a property that share and we are sharing like the same, it's the same technology some way, but they are used for very different things. Zero knowledge is to hide some inputs or to, you know, to have some kind of privacy in general. And uh, the other part of this zero knowledge technology is more for uh, succinct computation or for verifying computations in a succinct manner. And in a roll, in the case of the rollups, we are using very much the second property. It's the most important for rollups. This is the, like going back to that optimistic versus ZK rollup, it's like the fraud proofs versus the validity proofs, I guess you could call it. Exactly. The validity, the validity proofs is, is the, the what we are building here. We're building a validity proof yeah. that a set of transactions, creating a smart contracts or executing a smart contracts are valid. This is actually what, what we are doing. So the zero knowledge proof in this case is not, it's not a privacy proof. Like it is, you can actually see both sides of this this action. I guess the question here is like, does all of the EVM, the in the ZK EVM, does all of the action just sort of happen within a bubble? And then every once in a while with a zero knowledge proof get like re kind of checked to the main chain? Or is it like each transaction or each change, each like, I'm just sort of curious that like at what point are these zero knowledge proofs actually being used? Um, in, in, in the case of uh, the way that we are building the ZKVM, actually is, we are embedding like two proofs, uh, the two proof systems in, in there. So we are uh, mainly we are generating a Stark and then uh, we are verifying a Stark with a uh, Plonk or Growth 16. So we are like a proof of a proof, okay? Oh, wow. And the idea is that we are, we are combining two proof systems to get the best of each one. Okay, so the Starks are very good, but they have a problem that the, the proof size is, 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 is huge. And, and, well, you can verify it on chain, but it's very expensive. So what we are doing is we are building like a growth 16 or Plonk proof that actually ver verifies the Stark. So because the, the Stark proof just become a private input of the next, the size of the Stark 
doesn't matter anymore and we mm -hmm. can use all the advantages of the Stark and get also all the advantages of Gros 16 and, and, and Plonk, which is a very cheap uh, verification on time and very small uh, size proof. So combining these two things is, is very good for, for, for this. And actually, stars, they have like a, another important advantage is that the very verifier, so it's quite easy to build a verifier in a growth 16 circuit because the verifier of a star is just using a just a single field element so if it's a single field so you, if you are using the same field that the growth 16 then the the, the the verifier is very very cheap and very easy so the growth 16 is going to be as it's just a proof but the uh, the number of constraints is going to be quite a small mm -hmm. uh, in compared with a uh, real proof that's going to be in, in, in the Starks some way. So it's just we're combining these two technologies. Cool. We're, com getting, we're combining Plonk, we're combining Plonk Up, we're combining a Stark, we're combining Gross 16, we're like putting everything together and we're building the, the, the CKD. And that's very much the challenge that we have in front. So... Is it sort of like the first proof would be a Stark, which ends up resulting in a very large proof, but before you're actually, like this all remains within the ZK EVM still in that sort of space. But then because you have this large proof, are you then using Plonk almost as like a compression, like to then prove that large proof, you use Plonk to create a small proof and that's what you have to verify. And that is why it's cheap. Exactly. You are it, perfect. You, I think you did it. You, you explained it perfect. Cool. Okay. But the one part I still don't understand, though, is like, where are the Starks starting? Like every time anything occurs, is there a Stark attached to it? Like, I'm just kind of curious, like, yeah, where did those come from? Where are they living in this process? I'm not sure if, I, if I'm using here the word Stark correctly, uh, but the idea is that we're using the Fry proof, like the engine of Starks to verify polynomial commitments all together, okay? So that's, that, this is what we call it as the Stark. Probably it's not a Stark. You know, they, they, this is not a thing, but we are using the same technology as, as Starks. Is the this try to verify all the polynomial commitments, all these polynomial. We have a lot of polynomial relationships. The EVM has uh, hundreds of polynomial relationships because, no, the EVM is, is complex, okay? But all these proofs are together with the Starks, all this proof is verified inside a Gross 16 circuit or a Gross 16 or Plonk circuit, eh? if it's more or less the same, depending if you want trust the setup or not. Plonk is a little bit more expensive, but don't have to trust the setup. Gross 16 is cheaper, but it requires the trust the setup ceremony. So we probably will start with Plonk and maybe at some point, if this goes, maybe we'll do a Gross 16 just with a ceremony and so on, just mm. to stabilize that. But that's the, 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 the long term. But the circuit is the same, or is very so you can reuse the circuit in Gros 16 and, and Plonk. Actually, for example, in SnarkJS, we updated the SnarkJS um, some months ago that supports, right now, it supports Gros 16 and Plonk. So, with the same with Circom. So, all the programs brightened in Circom can be uh, now very, very verified. You can convert it to a Gros 16 uh, proof system or to a Plonk Gros system. So, we, Everything is it's more the same. Starx is uh, fry and it's, it's like a different world. It's a little bit different yeah. altogether. I think the, the question that I still have, though, is kind of going back to just like the opcodes. You sort of mentioned the polynomial commitments, but is it like on the execution of an opcode? And, and I might be mixing up some things here, by the way. It might be like state transition is actually what I'm trying to say. It's like you're going to be like using Fry. You're going to be like running. You're going to be basically generating one of these proofs at some point in the process. And I'm, I'm not clear, is it on an execution of something? Like, is it when there's been a state change that you would prepare one of these things? Or is it like after a batch of activity, like activities have basically happened and then you just sort of clump it together into a polynomial and then yeah, well let me, let, let me let me try to let me try to explain a little bit um, in the more it's a little bit more complex than that but just to be this is we have like different opcodes so the idea is to have we have like uh, many state machines that execute opcodes we have for example a state machine that executes uh, modular multiplications another state machine that's doing binary operations another state machine that's doing memory operations another that's doing storage and we have like different state machines each one very specific for specific opcodes, you know, very mm -hmm. specialized for doing specific opcodes. And 
we use uh, polynomial commitments to verify this state transition in, in, in each of state machines. Okay, so that that's, that's, that's we have this. Okay, now we need we need to link them all together. Okay, so the the codes that we are verifying in this state machine should be the ones that are executing in the main program, and and the, the same with the memories and the hashes that we are computing, and actually the same that we are computing when we are doing a storage, and the storage needs to be computed. So we need to link all these state machines, and here the key is the plug up plug up the idea is we have like different polynomials and we are just relating one each other at the end plug up what you're doing is okay you are this polynomial is included in this other polynomial that means that it's the code that i'm integrating in this specific state machine is actually the ones that i'm creating mm-hmm. here. and for this the key is plug up but plug up at the end is is done with polynomial commitment so you have the polynomial commitment you had before we have the new polynomial commitments that we have plug up so we end up like a, a lot a set a full set of polynomials you know, polynomials everywhere, yes. polynomials commitments everywhere, and a lot of relationships that the verifier needs to check about these polynomials. Okay, so this is what, what we have. And so all, the, all these polynomials commitments, at the end is our polynomials openings. All this is we use Fry to open all these, uh, to do all the openings of these polynomial commitments that we make. We do all the verifications and all that, we do it in a circuit, in a GRO16 or a Plonk circuit. I see. Okay, and the result of this Plonk circuit is actually what goes to the blockchain and is verified on chain. This is a little bit the scale. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you've touched, there's two things that you just brought up that we might want to like clarify a little bit. One is pluck up. So this is Plonk up kind of? Look up is I know that our, this is for also from Aztec I believe. Aztec and, yeah, it's Ariel. Yeah, Ariel, Ariel. Aztec, they, they they came up with this uh, construction. It's a yeah. very cool construction, and it's very 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 powerful. It's used in in many things, and uh, it's a very powerful piece for building up these these systems because it's what the glue is what allows to connect different virtual machines uh, to glue them together in a single proof. Are these proofs, are they being created after every transaction or are they being done like after a batch of transactions? Yes, these proofs, uh, is the same concept that as the current CK rollup. We are creating these validity proofs in the form of a batch. So we process, uh, we have a queue and these queues process, receive the transactions from the users and then the Hermes node just selected the title or the best uh, transactions to process and they do this processing of chain layer two, when you just change the states and, and so on, you execute all this uh, processing of chain. And the, the, the interesting thing here is that once in a batch, you just uh, create a validity proof of all the set of changes in the system at the same time. So it's uh, the prover we are building is the same concept as the secret rollup of transactions is one proof every whatever number of seconds with a maximal number of uh, transactions in the same batch to be more efficient, but it will be one proof in the improving a lot of transactions at the same time. You had sort of mentioned that like storage, there is like a, a method that you're using the, and maybe, maybe I didn't understand this, but like, are you also using these polynomial commitments and like that structure to manage storage? Or is there like another way that you need to think about that? Well, if we want to maintain compati- fully compatibility with the current ZKVM, we need to use the current Patricia trees. It's a kind of a Merkle trees that is using right now the Ethereum virtual machine. There are new ideas for replacing these Patricia trees ways, maybe using some binary trees or other different trees or even, or even polynomial commitments. And there are different, or even Berkel trees that was talking Italic at some point. And there are different ideas there. Uh, I would say in the ZK site and then even in the Ethereum site. So Ethereum is pro- probably they will upgrade at some point and remove the Patricia trees and goes to a different uh, structure for storage. This is something that's open, but it's open in, I would say in both sides. Eh? And, and in, our, in our case, the idea is to be compatible with all these Patricia trees, but it's possible that maybe we go with an easier, maybe with a normal tree, easier trees, and, and maybe we just break this compatibility because this is not an opcode. So the, the program should still work and this will be more efficient. And this is something that we need to consider and, and to evaluate. But these are different options there. I want to understand maybe how 
what you had described, going back to those earlier ideas of like other ZK rollups looking to do EVM implementations. So you had mentioned Starkware, ZK Sync, and that Loopring might be thinking about it. Oh, Ethereum Foundation too. Yeah, I just, oh. yeah. <laughs> Lots of people, I guess. Yeah. How are they approaching this? Like going, you know, you, you described sort of using the Stark and then using the Snark, but in the case of Starkware, would they also be doing something like that? Or do you think that they're approaching this in a different way? Uh, it's different because we, we are different engineers so we have different ways of thinking and, and different tools and, and things. I'm not going to say even which is good or bad. I think it's good to have like many projects, each one trying their best way. This is this will help yeah. a lot. And, and, and if there is communication, we, will, we should learn from one each other. And, 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 and this is something that in some way we are promoting. And it's quite happening, I would say, in the space for this uh, knowledge sharing and understanding which, which what's doing each one just to, to learn. But it's not clear what's the best you know it's just uh, the the good at this point is just try it do it and then we'll see and, and, and that's a cool thing here it's like no there is no no good approach or bad approaches at this point i would say that all the approaches are are good at this point and maybe at some point some of them will maybe us we just say okay this is a bad approach we just uh, we're wrong and this is not good <laughs> because this or that and then we just uh, yeah. explain we say we try to learn and work around and whatever this can happen to us it can happen to any of the projects but that's that's cool and at the end the important is to scale smart contracts that's what we are committed projects at and everybody's trying to do that but actually my question is more like do you know what they have planned and how does it compare not not which one's better but just like it, is it a very different approach I, i'm kind of trying to understand um how they look at it for what i have read and what i have listened there are different approaches uh, in some in some way, you know, but uh, that doesn't mean that that uh, those approaches are wrong. It's though they are just yeah. those approaches. <laughs> I mean, but can you speak about them? I'm just, I'm I'm also curious if you know like what they are. Yeah, I think we we explain. For example, Matterlabs is going more in this uh, recompiling, you know, having their own opcode and their own coding, so their own virtual machine and compiling Solidity to the this optimal virtual machine, Starks, they, ha- they also have like their own virtual machine with, you know, they have a project also to port the EVM to these virtual machines some way. I'm not sure about the details. You should ask them and how they are doing that. Totally. That, but they are, they, <laughs> Sounds they, they, like I should have them on the show. In the, it's in their plan too, but they are, they are working also in, in, in that direction. As far as I know, the Ethereum people, is thinking very much in Halo, for example, or they are considering Halo in, in yeah. Halo or some techniques that use it in Halo. The approach is more similar to us uh, in the um, be more uh, ZK EVM, so EVM com- fully EVM compatible, of course. We are talking with lots of these projects and, you know, in the technical side, we are just sharing a lot of information and, it, you know, it's like we are learning every day. That's awesome. Yeah. Going back to what you've actually, or what the designs for ZK EVM are, is the idea here that like it will support all opcodes? It will be actually one to one, or are there some limitations that uh, you could, you could foresee here? Definitely, there are opcodes that are more difficult to implement to the others, and uh, it's possible that there is um, maybe maybe the first version does not include like the full opcodes or the full precompiled smart contracts. But what's cool is at this point, I don't see any stopper on any opcode to be implemented. Even uh, the most complex opcodes, or even in this case, they are not opcodes, but they are pre-compiled smart contracts that are important, like paintings or big numbers, uh, smart contract or uh, KKK hash function. All those looks like they are doable. Okay, and they are it's just a matter of building and we need to see the efficiency and we need to see how we how it matches all together. But I don't see a, an a priori stopper for any opcode. There are opcodes, it's true that there are opcodes that are like very specific layer one opcodes that they will have to have some special treatment. For example, difficulty. You no, know, that there is nothing similar to difficulty in in uh, layer two. Okay, but what what happened with the, this opcode? Well, maybe it gives a high value or something like that, or 
block. There is no block, so it's um, maybe it's uh, equivalent to batch. Maybe the CKVM uh, have like some extra opcodes that are more layer two related. So it can be some, I would say, adjustment in in because it's it's different. It's not a layer one and layer two, and there are some opcodes that you need to find. This, for example, the reason uh, the optimistic people. They already did a good work on in adapting these uh, like specific opcodes, and but this is you know this is some something very concrete and very uh, specific to that. The important ones like you know the opcodes that are maybe complex, but they are doable. Like create you know an opcode that can create another smart contract that's a uh, hard or calls or delegate calls or of course storage or even these uh, pre-compiled smart contracts they are like signature verification or pirings or you know all these things that those are doable at least in the project that we're building we, we, we know how to build them we need to see how efficient and how they fit and all together but at least from the theoretical perspective they are uh, achievable that's why we want to at some point build all of them you know they need to be as much compatible as we as we can. There are things, eh? you know, the gas things, for example, what happened with the gas, they have to try to be as compatible as possible, but uh, it's gonna, are, there are going to be difference between layer two and layer one, and maybe there, there are some adjustments that need to be done uh, in the future. But when you are doing this, it's like you are finding like a lot of things, oh, what happened with this and what happened with that and and, and this what, and, and you are like solving this or maybe having a workaround or some solution in there that it has to be as, as, as the, the goal is to be as compatible as possible. Mm. Do you imagine actually like in these environments that it could go even further, that it could become a realm of like experimentation because you're not necessarily, you don't have the same constraints as the L1? Like, I, know, I know maybe it's a ways off because you're saying like the first release probably won't have all of them. So if, once you get to all of them, yeah, could you go further? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is yeah, it too it's far like, in it's, advance? It's like, uh, I don't know. So it's like, yeah. Like, like, Come on, Jordy, do more. Yeah, let's, let's, let's just, let's, I, I would be happy right now if we have like a small set of opcodes working uh, Okay. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's. Uh, we'll see. This is a uh, first approach. There are things that this work. Uh, more just talking like uh, the long future. Right? If you are talking this earlier, the fiction uh, things. But one one interesting thing of doing this opcode compatible uh, approach is that a lot of the work can be used for verifying L one blocks and. This is, uh, for example, something like protocols, like Mina protocol, things like that, or, or I think Fellow is doing something similar that's like, uh, you can, for especially for like clients that you are, so each block has a proof that verifies that the last block is valid and you have this kind of recursion. Yeah. Um, if you have all the all this proof that actually verifies all the transactions that are processed, uh, in this case a batch, you can have like a verification that these uh, that all the transactions that you process are included in this block. Maybe you should have you should add the consensus verification proof of work, proof of stake, or whatever in there, and then you could have a recursive uh, verification there. So that, that's something that okay, this is not like our main goal. Uh, our main goal is to build a zk VM uh, rollup, but uh, all the work that we are doing could be used in this uh, verification. And this would be good for like clients, for maybe for using these uh, blockchains in mobiles and and having a, a client that, you know, a like client in a mobile. This is something that's a good evolution for, for Ethereum. But again, this is like long run future. Stuff. But, uh, but uh, it gives you an idea of the importance of the work and uh, that we nervous, but also all the projects that are working in the ZKVM or ZK, so a virtual a ZKVM at least uh, projects, because this will help a lot to go in that direction. Mm. Jordi, you just mentioned gas, and I'm actually curious, like, what is the strategy for that? Like, do the do the L twos in this EVM like does it have to have the equal gas model? Can you get rid of gas completely? Uh, it's a hard topic. The idea is the problem of the gas is that uh, a lot of the security of the uh, Ethereum smart contracts of the security model is based on, on, on the gas. So 
Uh, if you want to have a compatible uh, EVM, you cannot change, at least in an initial version, this gas model. So the idea is to keep this gas model as compatible as, as we can. Okay, So that's uh, the idea is mm-hmm. to keep the same gas model all, all together. But said that, the gas was designed to be uh, for L1, was not designed for L2. So probably there are, in the future, you can think maybe in changing some gas costs and even some gas, the gas model in the ZKVM in a different way that makes more sense. But this is, it's something that needs to be studied. And our goal, at least in, the, in this moment, is to be as, com- as much compatible as we can to the current. We want that the developers that are building smart contracts in L1, uh, they can use the same tooling and we'll go to L2 and, mm-hmm. and, and, and works. What would the base gas token be denominated in though? Like, is it denominated in the native Ethereum. Hermes no, token? It's Ethereum. Oh, it's still in Ethereum. Okay. Even though it's within the ZK EVM. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can choose what you you can choose whatever you want, but I think that the ones that make sense is, is Ethereum. Is it sort of like a synthetic Ethereum, though? Is it like Ethereum locked on the L1, moved over to the L2 that's then used for gas? Or is it... Yeah, yeah like... it's like a roll-up. You probably have to okay. deposit and then just have some smart contract to get that, that, that Ethereum from there. Got it. It can be any. Yeah? It's like, a, it's like it's, it can be any. It could be any, but the idea is to be Ethereum. Cool. I have a kind of a higher level question about EVM compatibility in general. We've talked very much about like the different solutions, the ways that ZK EVM aims to like allow for this compatibility, like a, almost a one to one in terms of compiling, and it, it's sort of this this equal system. But why do you even want the EVM compatibility? Like, why would we want an exact EVM copy? Is it because it's such a fantastic system, or is there like some other reasons that you see? Well, uh, I can I can provide my comments here. Uh, I think uh, we were trying to solve from the beginning the scalability problem of Ethereum in the first place. Uh, so we want Ethereum to to be able to have to support more transactions. So of course we can build different systems, but this will be a a different pro- project. I think what Jordi just said regarding the gas and the security model is very important because there's a lot of smart contracts developed, there's a lot of audits done on existing smart contracts, and the security model uh, needs to be respected in order to manage the change to a CKVM. So if you build a different system, all this technology needs to be analyzed to, to see what's the impact on that. And uh, the CKVM tries to be compatible up co- up code level and to respect the gas model in order to behave the same as the EVM. Uh, so this will be very easy for developers to just migrate contracts to this system. And this will allow existing projects to migrate. You don't need to recompile ideally, you just move contracts. So this would be a huge benefit in terms of adoption. Because if you do different things, probably you will face friction in some way. The setup that you described though, could you ever use that to build out a different kind of VM? Do you know what I mean? Like, could you ever like... If you didn't only want EVM compatibility, but rather like another VM compatibility, would you be able to actually like plug that in? Or is this so deeply built together that it wouldn't be unextractable from one another? We need to think, we need to think a little bit, but the idea is that, so if you keep the backwards compatibility, that's what very much what we are doing, you can always like extend the EVM and do maybe different opcodes or different, even different structures just maybe for new smart contracts that are more, you know, with maybe with a different gas model and with different things. And this is actually doable. And this is, well, we may think to go in that direction, but the idea is to to keep all the all the work that has been done in you know development terms, in auditing terms, in in you know in understanding in that, that has been done for that. We need to warranty this backwards this some way this backwards compatibility or if you want this compatibility at this at, at this point so the strategy i think that goes more in that direction to try to keep the backwards compatibility as much as we can and from there maybe extend the zkvm or or just to maybe just to do it better and, 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 and just having a smooth transition in some way this is perfectly doable but we are a little bit far from there <laughs> 
So, so a few months ago when we did a bunch of episodes on L2s, one of the questions that we kept asking everyone was, how do you imagine interacting with one another? Like, how would someone use it, like working in the ZK EVM space actually potentially have a bridge or communicate with another, like an optimistic EVM compatible L2? Yeah, this is something that, for example, in Hermes, we developed all the, what we call massive migrations. And the idea is pretty much about that. It's just packing a lot of exits to a single exit that goes to another smart contract. So it's like with a single L1 transaction, you are like packing many transactions from one to the other. It, this is something that we have been working a lot in the last uh, in the last month. So we have a, like a, a well, we have a full team right now working on that, and we we made some. I think we made some improvements and very good improvements just to optimize these transitions. We are working this in the context of L, of uh, the payments of, of version one of Hermes. Okay, but all this work applies could can be applied, and all the learnings can be applied also to the CK EVM. And but this is something that we are working a lot because we know that massive migrations are going to be important uh, at some point, mm. and work is there. Got it. This is kind of a bit of an off-topic point, but something like Binance Chain in this context, like I know that there was a there was an article that came out by Hasib a few months ago, and what it suggested was like we're building all of this amazing ZK constructions, and they're so much more safe and secure. But then there's chains where they kind of did a much lazier connection point to the L1. Yeah, how do you sort of address that? What do you think about those kinds of chains? Look, uh, we are doing, there for me, there are different things. You know, we are building a decentralized systems and permissionless systems. If you want to build centralized systems, seriously, don't go to a blockchain. Just use normal servers and normal databases. They work great. <laughs> you will have much less, you will have much less uh, overhead. Uh, overhead. And it, the things work very good in that space, but. Uh, this is not what we are building here at all. Yeah. In my opinion, the, there's the, the fact that there are different needs for different use cases. And, and some of the applications or use cases uh, are willing to, to sacrifice some of the properties in order to achieve others. So I think it's, this, uh, it's a clear example of what will happen in the end, that there will be probably different tires of different solutions for different applications and depending on the requirements it, it could be fine so it's a combination of uh, different technologies in order to build a different solution and it's clear that it's uh, it's going to be okay depending on your use case the, the problem is that mm, someday something happened that this will not be good for the space but yes at, uh, up to this point uh, uh, we're trying to build the, the, the best solution we can with the existing tools we have today. And from here, you're always uh, capable of reducing some of the requirements by com combining other stuff. Totally. I also liked what you were saying before, Jordi, with like the differing approaches and like this is sort of, what is it, like testing testing live. Like these, these things are live or some of these things are live and we're going to see how they play out, which ones work, if there are actually like vulnerabilities with some of these more centralized systems that maybe aren't quite obvious right off the bat. Yeah, but it's important, Anna, to the, the people understand you know, the differences that's between a Binance chain and an Ethereum chain. Yeah. I think that yeah. if, if you don't understand the difference, <laughs> then uh, it's, it's problematic. You know, I'm not saying that Binance chain is not great. You know, it could be a very great for some applications, as David says. But they are different things, you know. They are trying to build a decentralized system, permissionless, censorship resistant. And it's important that we understand each system that we are building, what are the, the, the properties and the, the things, and even the stage we are. For example, we in Hermes right now, uh, it's quite centralized right now. It's uh, There is a single operator right now. We need mm -hmm. we need transactions to, to start the centralization. We explain that. We are saying that. We are... <laughs> We are not lying to anybody. anybody. This is what, what it is. And, and yeah. the, the same happened with, um, well, Ethereum is what it is. Bitcoin is what it is. And they actually understand each, each chain, each system, what's doing. And if you are transparent on what you are doing, what you are achieving, that's fine. The thing is that 
if you think that federated blockchain is the same that a decentralized blockchain, then uh, okay, maybe you, you you need to understand that. You know the, what happened when a government, a government, or specific governments have uh, threat the validators or threats the Binance itself or Binance blocks. Yeah, and what yeah. will happen with the chain? So this is these are questions that we need to understand. No, the networks, eh? like, I don't know, like uh, the Facebook one, you know, Facebook create a blockchain. It's okay. If you, if, if you, ask, if you are explaining what you are creating, it's good. You know, it's a proof of authority. It's what it is, but this is what it is. You need to understand what it is. This may be very good. This was great. I'm not against this. It's, this is good, but it's important that the people, so that the users, the, the, yeah, that the users know. and the people understand what this chain does and what the chain doesn't. And this is, yeah. This is very this is very important for the for the space. Basically, the trade offs that may not be explicit but are kind of built into the way that they're thought up and the transparency. Just to the transparency of what is each thing. So, what exactly you are you building? What kind of yeah. consensus are you building? What kind of properties are you achieving? What are the the threats? What are the risks? What 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 actually you are doing? If uh, mm-hmm. if you are transparent, then that's fine. But if you are trying to sell a blockchain as a fully decentralized and it's just a server running in AWS with some software, well, then that's, I think, it's, this is not ethical, correct? Yeah, fair. I want to hear a little bit about the timeline and the plan for ZK EVM. What stage is it at? We are running as much as we can. <laughs> this, this, this is the, the current stage. Is, <laughs> I keep putting running. pressure on you. Eh? <laughs> the, this, is the, this, is the, this is the current stage uh, we have. We have an internal roadmap that it, uh, maybe can can share with you a little bit uh, of what we are planning. But like, take it as an internal roadmap. You know, things may accelerate, may go slower. We, there are things that we may find, some maybe some stoppers that we need to fix. There are a lot of things to do. So it's not, do not take it as, uh, oh, at this date we will have it. No, we don't have, a, we are not at this stage. David, maybe you can you can share that a little bit. But the idea, so in a year, the idea is to have this in production in a year, more or less. That's the, the, the idea. Yeah, yeah, as Jordi was saying, we have the idea to develop as fast as we can. Of course, we also assume that some some issues will happen during the way. Jordi is working now the first proof concept uh, with the rest of the team, and we expect to have this uh, initial proof concept by the third quarter, probably the beginning of the fourth quarter. And we expect to, to share a, an internal testnet with some uh, reference uh, projects by the end of this year. From here, we'll continue developing and getting some feedback to start uh, getting the more maturity as possible and developing the opcodes by batches until we we finish expected one year. Let's assume it's half and next year. We will try to do it the fastest as we can. We'll see how far we can we can move uh, at this speed. Uh, but yes, we also want to be realistic because this is a very complex engineering project as you can yeah. you can see and a lot of things will happen during the way can you imagine i mean once once this is finished does it just merge into hermes like would it just sort of be in the same hermes roll up setup or would that kind of alter the way that you think about hermes as well we don't know it yet, but will depends very much how Hermes, the current Hermes, uh, evolves. If Hermes is used a lot, that means that's getting more decentralized. That means getting more fixed. Then probably this will be like a, a new rollup. It will be a new Hermes maybe with some migration from one to the other, but. Hermes one will go forever, and and then it's going to be a Hermes two. Mm. If uh, in the other side Hermes just is less used, maybe then it would be possible to evolve uh, to upgrade Hermes. In some way it's still not fully centralized, so we can upgrade and maybe we can upgrade Hermes to a new to a new rollup. Both options are open. And it will depend very much on many things, but mainly in how Hermes one evolves. Cool. Well, it sounds like there's a lot in the coming months, weeks, years for Hermes. And I'm so glad that you came on the show to share with us the ZK EVM, how you're planning on building this out. And yeah, why an EVM compatible ZK rollup could be really useful. Sounds great. Thank Perfect. You so Thank you, Anna. We are, we are open. Just uh, we are very, here. Just, very, uh, very, happy. very happy to be here, Michelle. Yeah. Cool. 
All right. So I want to say thank you to the podcast producer, Andre, the podcast editor, Henrik, and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. So soon after we did this interview, there was a huge announcement. And so I'm so glad that you've come back for this little extra bonus piece of the episode to tell us a little bit about what we just learned about in the press, actually. A huge merger is happening. Tell us what it's all about. Thanks, Anna. Uh, we are very happy to, to join forces with uh, Polygon team. After some discussions during the last uh, months, even, we we find that uh, this makes a lot of a lot of sense for us because uh, I think we have an amazing technology, but we need adoption. And uh, for us, after we launched the first release of the Hermes network, we faced this issue of the adoption. And um, for us, this agreement is uh, creating a lot of value for both parties, and we are very excited about uh, this merger, both for the project, both for the teams, and also because. We think we provide a lot of value or we try to do this uh, for the Ethereum community and for the objective of scaling Ethereum finally. Yeah. So two weeks ago, you had actually announced an announcement. You had said like something is in the pipeline. And I did notice a lot of Polygon folks coming around the zero knowledge chats. I don't know if you noticed them too, asking some questions, <laughs> learning a little bit of, around it. What are they saying to you? What do you feel like this merger is actually going to look like? Are you going to be their technology provider in a way? Are you is the roll up going to take over what they have right now? No, no, no. We are we continue to be like an independent independent team, and we have a main goal. The main goal is to bring uh, zkVM in production. This is, I would say, this is my. It was before the merge. It was like my focus, and now is continue to be the focus. And I would say with. Uh, well, with maximum intense. This is actually my, it's a project of my life. This is what I'm committed to. And uh, yeah, that's, you know, just after the after this interview, I just arrived now to Switzerland. After this interview, I just continue working on this and very excited to do. Of course, as, uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of unknowns. We are doing this new technology and there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of uh, stoppers that maybe we don't know yet and there is always a huge risk in there but we are convinced i'm convinced i'm personally convinced that this will this will happen also i'm convinced that uh, the bet that uh, polygon made in Hermes concretely but i would say in the rollups in the zk rollups uh, more generic is going to have their their fruits in some months. There is a lot of work to do, but that's and that's probably for, for the space. This is uh, this is the most important thing. Is that the zk rollups are and the zk technology. I think that at this point nobody have any doubt that's a, it's a way to scale the blockchain technology and 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 this is a, well, this is the bet and and very excited to be here and personally it's an honor to lead this and and push this. I think you're totally right on where you say it's like it is it's a massive kind of like reinforcement or thumbs up or like it sort of shows that like the zk rollups you know we talked a little earlier in this earlier episode all about the different kinds of roll-ups and how they are also sometimes, you know, I think I mentioned this where there's some talk like maybe ZK is too complicated. Maybe it won't be the winner in some way, but like, I think this is definitely a, a sign that it could be. If, if it can get the volume that Polygon has been able to generate, then it could really show its merit, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you know, the technology is, uh, well, you know better, you know even better than me. It's a very young technology and uh, it's a technology that's at this point is growing a lot and growing, when I'm saying growing, growing in the number of researchers, number of the people that's working on that, knowing on the people that's understanding on that, knowing, knowing, growing the people that's building on top of this technology. Well, just look at your podcast, you know, just uh, you have been there for a couple of years, maybe. Or three, three years, years yeah, three yeah. Years, that's, you know, just uh, comparing three years ago. You know, totally. And, 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 this, and, and, and this is, uh, you know, this is the, this amazing technology that allows many things, but scaling scaling blockchains is one of those things that this technology uh, allows and, and we will see, but it's still young and it's still a lot of work to do. And yeah, that's what we that's what we want to do. And, and that's why we are, we are so excited. 
It sounds like a call to action a little bit to the listeners, people looking to jump in to ZK now would be an amazing time to do it because, you know, the momentum is very, very strong and it doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. Yeah. And, and this is very important, especially, you know, we have this technology that, you know, has been created for many researchers for the last well, many years, you know, because even the, all the research is done in other research, and, you know, it's like many years. But the zero knowledge problem, at least the non-interactive zero knowledge comes from the 10 years ago, you know, it's a lot of groups that make a, a huge uh, impact in the research. But it has been a, it's a humanity effort. And time from researchers, you know, researchers have been working a lot. They, of course, they continue working, but mm-hmm. now is time of engineers. Now is time of, of, of implementers and and. Uh, really taking profit and bringing this technology to final users. And here is where engineers, we, we came to, to rescue. We are not, uh, we are more pragmatic. And sometimes, you know, this between mathematicians, pure people and, and the engineers, you have this, this, this kind of discrepancy. Trade-offs. Here. Trade-offs, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have, yeah, you are good in words. Yeah, that's, that's a good word. And, and yeah, but the, uh, we are bringing this to the final users. We are solving real people problems. And, uh, this step is, is is very important. It's not a step that can be done for a single person or for a single team. It's an effort that needs to be done from a whole community. Uh, mm-hmm. When I announced in Paris uh, how we are going to build the ZKBM, this is a plan. And, and you know, I'm using... Uh, we are going to use um, Star Wars technology. We are going to use Aztec technology. We are going yeah. to use ZK Sync technology too. So it's a community effort. In, and it's important that each person, even each individual, each individual team, just uh, study and work on this technology and try to add value to this technology because it's very easy to add value because everything needs to be done yet. So yeah. it's it's right now for an engineer, it's like it's... Um, we call it sometimes a blue ocean, you know, it's just, it's a place where you can, you can find your spot. You know, as an engineer, you can find your spot in, in, in something that you can build. And so, well, this is a, the current moment that we are living and just, I would just, it's, it's a call for action. Yes. It's just, uh, I, people that really wants to build things, new things for the humanity, getting to this technology, uh, understanding this technology and trying to think what's the best way to apply this technology to the world is something that you can find a place and you can add a lot of value. And as I told you, I, in, in, in your in your podcast, uh, you have been talking a lot about that. It's not only about the scaling, it's not about only about the scaling blockchains. This technology is amazing for, for totally. privacy. It's amazing for you know, all the multi-party computations. It's, 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 it's a lot of things that can, where this technology can be, can be applied. And, and it's important that we as a, as a community, if you want to say humans, we add value together. We help one each other to make, to make the humanity better, you know, in some way. And this is this generosity of the, of the te- technical people, which used to be in general, uh, this is very important when we have this new technology, because, uh, if we do it this way, we can go much faster. Cool. Well, I want to say congrats again to both of you. And I can't wait to see how this merge works and like what that means. But we'll be watching this really closely. It is a call out to everyone. Amazing time to jump into the ZK space. You know, head over to the channels. There's lots of people there who will help you get onboarded. And yeah, thanks so much for the interview. Thank you very much, Anna.